Mr. Kerry. Thank you very much. Um, we are very pleased to have with us this evening a very distinguished professor, Professor Mubtaz Ahmad. And today, Professor will be speaking on Islamic studies and scholars of the West, challenges and opportunities. Let me first say a few words about Professor Mubtaz. Professor Mubtaz Ahmad is Executive Director of the Iqbal International Institute for Research and Dialogue, Vice President, Academic Affairs, and former President of the International Islamic University, Islamabad, Pakistan. He studied political science from the University of Chicago and held various academic positions in several universities and institutions. His research expertise includes Islamic political thought and institutions, international relations, and public policies. He has published extensively, and some of his uh, important works uh, are Observing the Observer, the State of Islamic Studies in American Universities. This is a very recent publication. Public Policy, Theories, Concepts, Models, 2007. Muslims Place in American Public Square, 2004. Um, Professor Muntaz has a very strong interest in Islamic political movements, Islamic political thought and institutions, and he is also uh, has a strong interest in <coughs> politics. Yeah. So, without further ado, let me uh, invite Professor Muntaz to deliver his presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, this the reason I gave this book was because this is closer to the topic I'm talking about. And the other reason is that this book has come out only about three months ago. It's very fresh. Uh, what I am carrying is unfortunately a pirated copy. It's a photocopy. The original book looks much beautiful. Uh, uh, and, but this is a authorized pirated copy, which means authorized by the author. Uh, uh, would you like me to stand up and speak? Or? Yes. What would you like? Okay. And uh, can I take this uh, because I don't need this? Let me come close that. Yeah. Mr. Ladakh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here with you. Very select group of uh, my brothers and sisters uh, to speak on. This is on? No. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yes. Uh, at least in Singapore, something is not working. I thought that Singapore is technologically the most advanced country in the world, so I'm very happy. Okay. Uh, and, and it, I'm not going to make a formal lecture. It will just be some kind of a conversation, sharing some of the things that uh, I witnessed while I lived in the United States. First of all, let me uh, confess, which is, and the confession is, I'm not a scholar of Islamic studies. I've never been to a madrasa, never studied Islamic studies as a field, as a discipline. I'm a political scientist by training. My master's degree, BA degree, uh, second master from American University of Peru, my PhD from the University of Chicago, all political science. I'm a comparative politics student and uh, not a Islamic studies scholar. However, my interest in, uh, in, in how Islamic study is taught in American universities and how Islamic studies as a discipline is treated both in the Muslim countries, universities as well as the United States was from the point of view of a political scientist. So that's one uh, perspective that I want you to keep in view. To begin with, uh, let me say that Islam became a major topic of discussion in the United States, particularly after 9-11. And since then, it has generated a great uh, interest among the media outlets, among the academic institutions, among the uh, public policy makers, among the think tanks, and as well as among the religious groups in the United States. The educational institutions across the country in the entire United States are now struggling to cope 
with the increasing interest in Islam. Islam as a religion, Islam as a world culture and civilization, Islam as a faith, and much more importantly, Islam as a strategic threat to the United States of America. Immediately after 9-11, you must have read somewhere, it's a common knowledge, that the copies of the Quran were no longer available on the shelves of Barnes & Noble, the largest bookstore in the United States. And Barnes and & Noble and a couple of other big chains of the bookstores were scrambling to buy the books from the publisher, the copies of the Quran, because there was so much interest in Islam on the part of the American people. And the interest was obviously for all the wrong reasons. What happened to the United States was a terrorist attack by a few Muslims, right? And now, suddenly, every American became interested. Where did this terrorism come from? And their answer was probably from the Quran. So let's go by the Quran and read. And the assumption was as if Quran is a manual of bomb making. <laughs> And it is from the Quran that those 19 hijackers had studied how to hijack the airplanes and destroy the World Trade Centers. So there was an interest in Islam, and particularly in the Quran, but in my view, for all the wrong reasons. Similarly, in American universities, enrollment in the courses of Islam increased enormously. I remember uh, immediately, uh, immediately after 9-11 took place in September, uh, September 11, and uh, the, the fall semester was already going on. I was teaching at Hampton University and just across the bridge on the Atlantic Ocean is a major naval base of the United States, probably the largest naval base they have you must have heard the name Norfolk. Mm. Uh, Norfolk is also mm. the headquarter of the Atlantic Command, uh, US Atlantic Command, NATO. Anyway, uh, Old Dominion University is one of the oldest universities in Southeast Virginia. The dean of the Old Dominion University called me and said, Muntaz, would you be willing to teach a course? That was before 9 11. Just uh, probably three, four weeks before that, for the next semester, beginning in January, would you be willing to teach a course or introductory course on Islam? First I apologize, I said that, well, I'm too busy teaching courses in my own university and I may not have the time. He said, no, 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 we'll schedule your course once a week. It will be for three hours, once a week, seminar type of course. But we won't, because there is no teacher in the entire university are in the Department of Religion and Philosophy who has any specialization on Islam. I said, well, I'm not a specialist in Islamic studies, but as a Muslim, I may have some knowledge about Islam, so I can teach a course on introduction to Islam. Anyway, I received uh, some paperwork contract I signed that I'll be teaching this course, Introduction to Islam, beginning January, next semester. Sometimes in the early December, I received the catalog, the listing, the small booklet of about the courses that have, were being offered by ODU for the next semester. And I look around the page and then see where my course is listed. Do you know how did they put my course? The title of the course was no longer Introduction to Islam. The title of the course was Jihad and Islam. <laughs> <laughs> Picked up the phone. I said, what, what, I mean, why did you change the title? This was after 9 11, right? Before 9 11, it was introduction to Islam. <laughs> after 9 11, the dean himself changes the title and prints the catalog. It's Jihad and Islam. I said, why did you do that? He said, because you will have more students. <laughs> <laughs> the word Jihad 
cells like heart cakes. <laughs> so, if we have jihad in the name of the course, you'll see how many students will end up. And lo and behold, in the very first week of the, of the enrollment admission, I was told that more than 60 students have already enrolled from my mouth. 60 students. And the dean before 9 11 was thinking about between 10 to 12 students. <laughs> that gives you an understanding of, of the idea of how things change in the United States and the interest about uh, Islam and Islamic studies increased. <clears throat> Recently, uh, there are many Ivy League universities that have received uh, millions and millions of dollars of funds, some from the Arab countries, some from the IIIT, some from the U.S. Foundation, to establish chairs in Islamic studies. Luckily, only in Stanford, which is one of the finest universities on the West Coast, a Pakistani doctor and his wife, who is also a doctor, they gave nine million dollars to establish a chair in Islamic studies. Another chair was established at Georgetown University, one chair was established recently at George Mason University, at Harvard University, in Indiana University, in the University of California. <coughs> and you know, in order to establish a chair, particularly in the first great Ivy League University, you need at least a minimum of 10 to 20 million dollars. Georgetown insisted that if they want an Islamic studies program, they must have 20 million dollars. Harvard got about 25 million dollars. So, this shows how Islam is becoming popular. It's uh, selling like uh, McDonald's uh, burgers. Uh, recently, the debate on teaching Islam to the American <coughs> campuses also reached another uh, level. When a summer orientation uh, program at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, there's a professor called Carl Ernst, E-R-N-S-T. And I would urge all of you to read his book that was published about three, four years ago. It's called Following Muhammad. It's a beautiful book, not a very big book, about 200 pages, Following Muhammad. It's a beautiful biography of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but with reference to the issues of the modern age, written by a Christian, and he's a student of Islamic Sufism, mysticism. So there is much kind of mystical, esoteric approach within that book. <coughs> Carl Ernst, uh, what the University of uh, uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, what they do is that they announce the admission of the new students just before the summer. The new academic year starts in September and uh, summer, summer, summer begins in the early June. And they announce the, those who will be attending the university next year in September, sometimes in March or April, or sometimes in May. Anyway, University of North Carolina had a program that they sent a letter of admission to all their students. And along with that letter, they give a list of the book that when you come here in September, make sure that you have read these books during the summer. And during the first couple of weeks after the freshman class comes to the university, in the supervision of some senior professors, they discuss those books with the students, just to make sure that they have read it and they, if they have some question. What Carl Ernst did was, for the first time, he included a book written by Michael Sells. If you have heard his name, his book is called Quran, The Early Revelations. What Michael Sells did was, he selected the early revelations of the Quran, early surahs of the Quran, and he translated them into a beautiful English, absolutely beautiful. Um, I have rarely seen such a beautiful translation of the Quran by somebody. He's a good scholar of Arabic and Islamic studies. 
And the book also comes, by the way, with a with a cassette, with a CD, in which he has given several different kera, in the recitations of the Quran, Egyptian, uh, Turkish, and Indian, Pakistani, etc. Anyway, so Karl Ernst added that book, the Quran, early revelations, in the reading list. Suddenly, hell broke out. Every single Christian group in North Carolina stood up and just said, what is this university doing? Is it going to convert our young Christian girls and boys to Islam? <coughs> university of North Carolina took the position that no, no, we are not proselytizing. We are not converting people. We want the students to know what the Quran says. It's an academic study, but nobody listened. Much, uh, probably about two dozen different Christian fundamentalist groups went to the court, in the federal court. And since the UNC is a state-funded school, therefore, the legislature of the North Carolina state threatened that they will cut the budget of the entire university if they do not withdraw the study of Quran from the students. Luckily, the president of the university took the position. He said, no, I'm not going to listen to you. If you want to cut down the budget of the university, go and do it. But I am not going to be talking. Anyway, the case went to the federal court. And luckily, the federal court decided that the university has an autonomy. It's an academic institution, and the teachers have the autonomy and the authority to recommend any book to read. And obviously, the professor is not recommending the reading of the Quran in order to convert the students, but in order to make them familiar with what the Quran has to say. So, this again became one very interesting case of the Islamic studies in American universities at that time. Uh, the academic circles in the United States have also been engaged in two other debates uh, after 9-11. One is around the question of liberal and moderate Islam versus the extremist Islam, as you probably all are aware. Even in Singapore, I've seen some books here, extremist Islamic interpretation, Islam and radicalism, Islam. This is liberal Islam, this is radical Islam, this is extremist Islam, this is a moderate Islam, all these things. This became a major topic of interest in the American universities and among the think tank people, scholars. And the question basically was that who has the legitimate authority to represent and interpret Islam? Osama bin Laden, does he have the religious authority to represent our, uh, what was the name of that uh, Yemeni uh, guy, American citizen who was hit by the US drones and killed recently? Allah uh, yeah. Does Alaki or Osama bin Laden or some of the other extremists, do they have the authority to be representative of Islam? And uh, then, if you remember, Rand Corporation came up with this theory. Uh, it was written by the wife of a very good friend of mine, probably you know his name, Zalmay Khalidzar, who was the US ambassador to Iraq and then US ambassador to Afghanistan. He's an Afghan guy, but uh, if you like to say it, nationalized citizen. He married a, a girl from Vienna and uh, she wrote a book. She wrote a study for Red Corporation. What did it say? And that became a very popular advice book, a manual for the people in the State Department, in the Defense Department, in the White House, among the U.S. Congress people. And that, would be, that report became a must read among the graduate students in American universities. 
And that report basically said was that the future of Islam and Muslims lies in liberal Islam. And what the United States and the American universities try to do is to promote moderate Islam, liberal Islam. <coughs> Among the moderate Islam, they probably thought of the Sufi kind of interpretation of Islam, a more liberal interpretation of Islam. And as I was saying in the morning, no matter how often you say Islam is a religion of peace, Islam is a religion of compassion, Islam believes in universal values and all these things, no one is going to believe you. Okay, yeah. They still believe that, no, 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 you are hiding something. <laughs> Tell me, I mean, what is really in your, your hiding? Anyway, so this debate became very important in America, you know, see, liberal Islam versus the radical Islam, the moderate Islam versus the... What Mahmoud Mamdani uh, once uh, described in his book, uh, this, this is another book that you should read, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's book, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. Uh, and, and basically the debate was who was a good Muslim, who was a bad Muslim, who was a, uh, a radical extremist and who was a I remember one of the stand up comedians on one of the American television shows, uh, he said that the difference between a, an extremist Muslim and a moderate Muslim is that an extremist Muslim burns the American flag and the moderate Muslim only boils it. <laughs> uh, in other words, if you are a Muslim, uh, you have to do something nasty. Uh, and there is not much qualitative difference between the radicals and the and the and the uh, both the kind of modern Muslim. The second debate uh, was about the nature and the outcome of the Middle East area studies centers in various American universities. This debate started with the publication of a book by a I would call it very Blatantly, a Zionist pro Israeli writer, Martin Kramer. And the book, the title of the book was Ivy Towers of the Sand. And that book was a devastating critique of the American academic institutions, accusing them that all American centers of Middle Eastern studies and Islamic studies are pro-Islam and pro-Muslims. Can you believe it? We the Muslims here sitting in Malaysia, Singapore, Pakistan, we say, oh, all American universities are anti-Islam, anti-Muslim. And here is a book that comes and accuses all major centers of Middle studies and Islamic studies. said, they are all on the payroll of the Muslims, of the Arab Shades, of Islam and therefore they are giving a very sympathetic picture of Islam to the American people and Martin Kramer not only accused uh, major centers like uh, University of Chicago and Pennsylvania and Columbia and uh, University of California at uh, Berkeley and uh, UCLA and uh, what other major centers of Islam studies but he also accused the State Department. And he said that the State Department, since the early 1950s, has been developing generations of what he called Arabists, who are anti-Israel, who are anti-Jew, and who are pro-Muslim and pro-Arab. This debate, and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you this information of this kind of perspective, to let you know that while we Muslims are always crying and uh, complaining that the American universities are anti-Islam, there are some people who are looking at the situation from the other side. And they say, no, 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 they are very pro-Muslim, pro-Islam. <laughs> and I think uh, Martin Kramer's reference point was the writings by Professor Edward Said in Colombia, John Esposito, from uh, from uh, Georgetown, John Wall from uh, Georgetown, and uh, John and Tallis uh, from Fordham University, and uh, uh, Tamara Son from uh, from from yeah, Miller, Miller and Mary, and Michael Sensnow from University of Chicago, and Carl Hertz from 
University of North Carolina, and many others, including Michael Hudson, who I'm told is right now yes. here, director at the Center of Middle Eastern Studies yes. at, uh, at uh, uh, yes. National University of Singapore. Look, absolutely first rate scholar, very fine scholar, and equally a fine human being. I mean, uh, <laughs> Singapore would not have a better choice as the director of the Center of Middle Eastern Studies than Michael Hudson. Now, the study of Islam and Muslim societies in the form of the area studies program, that's another interesting uh, thing to, to look at. Uh, at most of the American uh, campuses was primarily a response to the post-World War II situation. And that was the situation in which the United States emerged as a superpower with immense involvement and investment in the Middle East region about which it didn't know anything. Who were the superpowers in the Middle East region before World War II? The Britain, the French, right? Or the Italians to a certain extent. The Americans had absolutely no influence in the Middle East before World War II. Maybe they had certain missions uh, at two universities. One uh, was the American University of Beirut, which I attended, attended by masters, which was known as the Syrian Christian College mm -hmm. a long time ago. But the Americans didn't have any interest in the entire region. Yet. They didn't know anything about it. Immediately after the World War II, when the two major colonial powers had uh, were defeated, almost shattered, and they had to leave the Middle East, there was a power vacuum. The British had to leave most of the Middle East, particularly in the 1950s, uh, uh, then, and then the French had to leave. The Americans were asked to fill the vacuum. And now they were the one to keep an eye on the entire region. The United States now formed itself primarily engaged in the affairs of the areas about which it had little, if any, knowledge available. Because there was no history of Islamic studies in American University before World War II. You look at the directives of the uh, people who were in the Department of Religions teaching in American universities, and you will see not a single name not a single course being offered anywhere on Islam. Probably in the Department of Comparative Religion, probably somebody uh, takes one week, uh, two weeks, something about Islam and Prophet Muhammad. It was obvious at that time to the policymakers that without an adequate base of knowledge about the religion and the culture and the history and the socio-economic conditions, and the political dynamics of the Islamic societies, it would be difficult for the United States to assume its new international responsibilities of power. Hence, there was a need for the specialists in Islamic studies, in Islamic history, in the Islamic languages like Arabic and Persian and Turkish and maybe Urdu. Uh, Nobody was interested in Pasha. I'm very sorry to say that that time. Anyway, now they are teaching Pasha and Cornell and a couple of other places. Uh, and the idea was that to prepare such specialists who could uh, <coughs> combine the area expertise with professional training in an academic discipline. For example, you are a political scientist, you will specialize in Egypt, right? You are a sociologist, you will specialize on Syria. You are an economist, and as well as at the same time, you are specialist of Pakistan. So, disciplinary training and area specialization. That became a kind of combination under which the American universities was also operating. And it was uh, also interesting to note that the initial funding for establishing Islamic studies program and the area study center came from the from where? 
for the Department of Defense. Not from the Department of Education. All these centers that were created in the 1950s, later in the 1960s, of Islamic studies, of Middle Eastern studies, they were funded by the Pentagon, by the Department of Defense. National Education Defense Act, NEDA. Our Title IV grants, which was a uh, giving money to the universities from the Defense Department who are teaching languages that are strategically important for the U.S. foreign policy. That's very interesting. Later on, of course, the funding started coming from uh, different foundations like the Asia Foundation, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, but even these foundations did not put up the money from their own pockets. They got the money from the U.S. government and then they disbursed the money to, to different universities. Now, another point. Unlike the European universities, where the emphasis always has been, or probably not any level, but emphasis was on classical Islamic studies, American universities have mostly remained focused on modern Islamic developments. The overwhelming context of the Cold War, because the United States was fighting the Cold War with the Soviet Union, and the idea of studying Islam in Islamic societies was to win the Muslim countries towards the Western camp and to save the Muslim countries from communism, right? And from Soviet domination. So it was the logic of the Cold War that dictated the terms of academic debate in the United States, as far as Islam is concerned. And it was the Cold War that defined the logic of the scholarly activities in the American Academy. And that's how the funds were procured from the U.S. Government. Uh, that's why the American universities and the American government funding did not see any utility in studying traditional scholarship on Islam, such as Arabic uh, philology, uh, such as the textual kind of uh, uh, studies of Islam, of the Quran, of Hadith, of Fiqh, and other classical Islamic <laughs> sciences. It's only after 9-11 that the United States government became interested in such classical Islamic concepts as uh, jihad and jihadah. These are the two I mean, the religious concepts. Before 9-11, there was no interest shown in any classical Islamic theological concept, like what is jihad, martyrdom, what is jihad. And, uh, the first, of course, was the gift of Osama bin Laden, Jihad, and the second was the gift of uh, Imam Khomeini, Jihad, 1979, Iranian revolution. Everyone, everybody became interested. Why did the Iranian uh, uh, were able to organize uh, and successfully launch a big revolution? And what was the answer given by most of the American Academy? Well, in Shia theology, martyrdom and blood are very important. Therefore, I, this was one of the most stupid uh, explanations of the Iranian revolution. I was uh, in one of the conferences of one of the very senior American <coughs> professors and he was explaining the, the, the origin of the Iranian revolution of 1979. That, well, it is an integral part of the Shia political theology. Uh, kind of political activism in uh, seeking shahada and the kind of flogging. I said, well, the same political theology of Shiism existed before. Why in 1979 there was a revolution? We have to ask this question. That's very important because it was the same Shia theology that was preaching quietism for hundreds of years and the same Shia theology that became a, a message of revolution. So, and, but the, what I'm trying to say is that the obsession with such concept became so 
so urgent for many of the uh, American academics and even policy makers. Well, a friend of mine who did his PhD from uh, Canada, uh, on Homer and other diseases, what we wrote a beautiful, beautiful thesis. And uh, he finished his PhD, wrote his thesis, but then he had certain unanswered questions about Omar bin Abdul Aziz, the Umayyad caliph, not Omar the second caliph. He had some unanswered questions and he wanted to pursue his uh, postdoctoral research. And he asked me, can you suggest some uh, centers of uh, Islamic history who can provide him with some postdoctoral <coughs> fellowship to work on these questions about Umar bin Abdul Aziz? Uh, I said, I may check uh, and refer to you, why don't you send me your proposal? So he sent me a proposal asking some of the very important historical questions, particularly the question about the sources of Umayyad history. And I sent to a few centers of uh, funding, no response. No response. Then suddenly it occurred to me, I called it after about three, four months. I said, look, you have to be a little disingenuous but I can tell you a trick, how to get the funding. He's a very honest person and very truthful. I mean, uh, he's, he's very careful of what he is. He said, no, 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 I don't want to commit fraud. I said, no, 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 I'm not asking you to commit fraud. <laughs> Just put the word jihad in the first paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Some audience. I don't know how you will do it. But just put the word jihad in the first paragraph of your proposal relating it to Umar Abdul Aziz or to Umayyad period, <laughs> and I can give you a guarantee, 100% you'll get the funding. <coughs> Go ahead, do you, do you know what happened? He did get the funding. He did pursue it. Uh, he said he doesn't want. He just wanted to test the water. Anyway, there's another interesting question. I want you to, to address yourself about the, how Islamic studies is conceived. And that is the question of the geographical groupings of the Muslim societies in the area of studies program in the American universities. And uh, this geographical grouping has always been an issue of uh, enormous academic interest and debate, not only in the United States, but on some of the Western societies as well. Now, for programmatic purposes, most of the American universities is divided Islam and Muslim world into what they call Near East, uh, what is, what is, uh, North Africa, or uh, no, North, <coughs> North East or Middle East. Most of the centers were called Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Center for Near Eastern Studies. And the most important thing was that this Near East and the Middle East included not only non-Arab countries like Turkey and Iran, but in many places they also included entire North Africa within the, within the Middle East and the Near East. And they included Central, Central America also in some case, all the way to Pakistan. So it was very funny how you divide the Muslim world. And then uh, they divided South Asia, Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Center for South Asian Studies, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then Centers for Southeast Asian Studies, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and then uh, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Philippines, etc. Uh, however, the most interesting thing to know is that the centrality in the study of Islam was given only to the Middle Eastern countries and within the Middle Eastern countries only to the Arab countries, <laughs> which constitute about how much? 10 to 12, 15% uh, of the total Muslim population. The 80% of the Muslim <coughs> world, Muslim people, live outside the Arab world and nobody bothered. So, when they taught Islam, and when they talked about Muslim countries, Muslim societies, Muslim world, it was Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, you know, we finished. 
end of story. Very interestingly, one of uh, my friends who was a colonel in the U.S. Army, later he did his PhD from the University of Chicago. He has written very good books about uh, uh, his bulma in Lebanon, Dick Norton. He was in the State Department for a while. He said that uh, one of his uh, friends who was in charge of the donation desk in the State Department uh, received a phone call from somebody, uh, other government agency, to do some questions about Islam. And he said, I'm looking after Indonesia. I have nothing to do with Islam. Talk to the desk office of, of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> See what's going on. The man who is taking care of the U.S. relationship with more than 200 million Muslim populated country says, we have nothing to do with Islam. And he's asking his colleague, go and ask the Saudis. I mean, as if the Saudis have the monopoly over Islam. And they have the only authority <coughs> to discuss Islam. That's how American mindset works within that framework, within the area studies, particularly. And, uh, but this is also uh, quite interesting, I mean, to see uh, when you Whenever I come across these two, the Middle East and the Far East, the question comes to me, are the Near East? Near from where? And when you say this is Far East, and you naturally ask the question, far from where? <laughs> Have you ever thought about it? Actually, it is far from <clears throat> London. Near from London. And the stupid as we are, even though we are sitting in China, we call ourselves, we are the Far Eastern countries. It means that I am far away from myself. <laughs> and even the people who are living in the Middle East, they call themselves al Sharq al Ghazal. But get it, man. I mean, you are, it was a white man sitting in London who thought that London is the center of the world. And he was the one who was saying, oh, China is far away from us. That's why we call it Far East. And uh, uh, Palestine, Iraq, and Syria are closer to us. Turkey is closer to us. That's why we call them Near East. But we, the ignorant Muslims and the third world people, continue to use the same geographical category. But that's it. Footnote about <laughs> which uh, I did not go into detail. No, what were the main objectives of these area study centers? Obviously, to train the experts who could assume positions in government and the universities and in the corporate sector to inform and to educate and influence the formulation of US foreign policy and to produce a body of knowledge that would filter down to public schools and public opinion. Unfortunately, nothing of the sort happened. The academic institutions did produce a very large number of scholars on Islam, and I would say very fine scholars. I have absolutely no doubt about it. I had off to the scholarship that was produced. However, that scholarship never filtered at the level of popular cultural discourse. That scholarship had absolutely no impact on the US foreign policy either. Because if you look at the American scholarly products on the one hand, and then you look at the most stupid U.S. foreign policy actions on the other, you will see a total disconnect. Total disconnect. <coughs> look at the American scholarship on the Arab-Israeli issue, and look at the American State Department and White House policy towards Israel and the Palestinians. 180 degrees 
about poles of rock. In other words, it appears that the American academic products have no impact on the US foreign policy making. And also, these academic scholarship works have not filtered down at the level of the public schools, at the level of the media. The media continues to stereotype Islam and Muslims in very vulgar terms. So, in a way, I would say that these area studies and the Islamic <laughs> study centers have failed in achieving the objectives for which they were established. And I think this is one of the reasons why you see continuous failures in the US foreign policy towards the Muslim societies. People in the State Department and the White House and in the Pentagon, they don't, they are not interested in the fundamental issues. There are issues in urgent things, what happened yesterday, what happened today. I remember in 1981, immediately after the, two years after the Iranian revolution, I finished my PhD, went to Washington from Chicago, and uh, I joined the Brookings Institution, which is the premier uh, center kind of uh, think tank, major think tank, which is closer to the Democratic Party. And uh, I was working with Bill Kwan, who was uh, President uh, Carter's National Security Council advisor, on US foreign policy towards the Middle East. Anyway, when I arrived at the Brookings, uh, two weeks, three weeks after that, I was asked to give a lecture there, public lecture, uh, to the colleagues in, in, in at the Brookings Institution, and then the Brookings invited people from the State Department and some of the other government agencies like Pentagon, including probably the intelligence agencies. Uh, you could look at people's faces and you can recognize these as CIA. <laughs> <laughs> So, there was a large group of people, and coming uh, straight and very fresh from the University of Chicago, and uh, in, in the University of Chicago, they don't teach you policy, right? uh, never, which is, which is a bad thing to do. Uh, University of Chicago is only interested in theory, 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 no policy. I remember uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, in the economics department, when they would teach the freshman class, economics 101, the huge hall, about 120 students, you would enter the room, go straight to the blackboard, and you would write three words. Equality, social justice, policy. And then you would look towards the student and say, these three words are banned. <laughs> we don't believe in social justice, we don't believe in equality, and we don't believe in giving policy advice. So anyway, so being present from the University of Chicago, I, they asked me to uh, speak on what is Islamic fundamentalism. And if I remember correctly, I could give you the title of my talk. And the title was given by uh, Bill Quant. And the title was, What in the name of God is Islamic fundamentalism? And what should we do when we see it? <laughs> so, I probably spoke for about 35, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and basically I raised certain issues of theory, most theoretical questions. And after I ended, uh, one of the guys who was from the State Department, he raised it and said, he said, well, Dr. Rahman, uh, uh, your presentation was good, all he said, but I'm not interested in all kinds of theoretical <coughs> things that you're talking about. What I want to know is, when and where is the next U.S. Embassy going to be bought? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> so, what's my point? If you ask these dumb questions from the academics, then that's what happens to your foreign policy. If you don't ask fundamental questions, then you, there's no uh, possibility that you can formulate your foreign policy on, on certain some grounds. A uh, couple of other things I want to share. Uh, it's very <coughs> interesting to see that uh, 
there are about 3,000 members of the Visa, Middle East Studies Association. These are the people, American professors, who are studying Middle East. Many of them Middle Eastern religions, culture, history, politics, economics. The Association of Asian Studies, on the other hand, has only 150 members who are specialized in the study of Islam. Can you believe it? There are 3,000 American professors who are doing Islam in the Middle East. Only 150 who are doing Islam in Asia. And consider the fact that Asia has the overwhelming majority of Muslims living here. 80% of the uh, Muslims who live here in Asian countries have no representation. The American Academy of Religion uh, also has uh, about 170, 180 members, uh, don't have the exact count, who have some academic interest in religion of Muslims, not Islam per se. So, there's one other thing I want to say. It's very interesting to know that in the formative phase of the study of Islam in American universities, the manpower, especially in Islamic studies, came primarily from the expatriate European scholars are from non-Muslim Arab scholars, Arab Christian scholars, like uh, Albert Hurani, Charles Isabi, uh, Philip Hinti, uh, some of the very prominent Christian Arabs who migrated to the Western countries and established a great tradition of Islamic studies there. But most of them, the Europeans, who migrated to the United States and established new centers of Islamic studies, they came from the disciplines as Arabic language, Arabic philology, classical and medieval Islamic studies, history of religion, and early Islamic history. Both Sir Hamilton Kidd, who came from Oxford, first to Chicago, and then to, uh, then first to Harvard? No, first to Chicago, then to Harvard. <coughs> And then uh, Juan Kronemann, who came from Germany, <coughs> first to Chicago and then to uh, UCLA. They were the ones, Sir Hamilton Kidd and Juan Kronemann, who established the real foundations of Islamic studies in American universities. And since both of them were classicists and Arabists, linguists, historians, Arabic language, classical Islamic experts. So, the centers that they established were oriented towards the study of classical Islam uh, and humanities. When the Cold War became, came on its peak <coughs> and heightened, it was only at that time that the Islamic studies transformed and changed from humanities and classical Islam to modern Islam and to strategic Islam. Uh, I'm not, uh, I mean, going to beat my own drum or something like that, but I remember my teacher at the University of Chicago, Leonard Binder. Probably you must have heard his name. He did his work on Pakistan, Iran, Egypt, Morocco, Lebanon. Very fine political scientist. One of the finest political scientists probably of the 20th century. And anyway, Leonard Binder, Leonard Binder once said to me that, uh, sir, you must have heard the name of